our task for today, guys, is to kind of wrap up uh, lesson three five. Uh, we've talked about a lot of things in this lesson, you know, all the way back from before break. You know, we talked about, you know, what is rate of change? What do we mean by slope? How do we find the slope of a line? Um, we've even done lots of activities. You know, what does it mean in the context of the problem? We think all the way back to when we did the stacking books task and Paul's haircut. And, you know, we've just done lots and lots of stuff with it. So what I want to do is I want to uh, take today and just do this task that you have in front of you called Reflections of Rate of Change and slope intercept equations. Um, just trying to, you know, connect all the dots here, right? You know, put everything together that, we, that we've been focusing on recently. Okay, so let's kind of go through this task together. So uh, what I want to do is I want to look at a graph in context, right? So if you look at your handout, we have a graph titled Company Growth, and along the x-axis we see that there are years listed there. And our y-axis is the number of employees that they have in each of those given years, okay? All right, uh, so our first task, it says use the graph that shows the number of employees at a company between 1994 and 2002. And you can see that those are the dates on our x-axis here, okay? 1994 to 2002. Find the rate of change described and the intercept and its meaning. Okay, so let's look at number one. Find the rate of change in the number of employees between 1994 and 1996. So I want to look at this graph, and you'll notice that the graph isn't just one straight line. It's different line segments. That's why we're looking at the rate of change just between certain dates, okay, because it, the rate of change changes between varying dates, okay? So we're going to look here from 1994 to 1996, and I want to know the rate of change just during that time period. I'm sorry, I said that. Yeah, that's right, 1994 to 1996. So what we could do, since I have the graph right here in front of me, is I could count rise over run, right? I could count rise over run. The problem is, and you'll notice, that you can't just count boxes here because these dots aren't on whole boxes. And look at your scale, okay? Scale meaning what we're counting by. Each box doesn't represent one employee, does it? Okay, in fact, uh, what are we counting by here? I guess each box would actually be five, right? Five, 10, 15, 20, and so forth. Uh, and that gives me a little better idea of what my rise over my run might be, but still, you know, you'd have to estimate where this dot is and you'd have to estimate where uh, the dot here at 1996 is. Uh, and I can't really do that with uh, accuracy, so, that's why uh, on the graph, they gave me the actual order pairs. See, they told me that 1994 was at uh, 18 and that 1996 was at 32. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come over here and I'm gonna write down those two points here. 1994 comma 18. So in 1994, they had 18 employees. And in 1996, the company had 32 employees. So if I want to find the rate of change just in that time span, what we're going to do is we're going to label these, right? This would be x1, y1. This would be x2, y2. And we would use our slope formula, okay? y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. So the vertical change right here on my graph, it was going to be whatever I get when we subtract um, let's do that again. I would subtract 32 minus 18 because I'm finding the difference between the y values, 32 and 18. Okay, and then on my x values, my run would be the difference between um, 1996 and 1994. Okay, that would be this value here, the change in my x values. All right. So I believe when we do that, I get uh, 7, sorry, I get 14 over 2, which would reduce to 7 over 1. Okay. So now the question says, uh, you know, find the rate of change. Well, yes, it's 7 or 7 over 1, but we really need to write that on our paper in, in words. What does that mean? That means that uh, they're gaining because it's positive 7, okay? that the company is gaining seven employees per one year. All right, 
or per year. Okay, that's what this seven over one means because seven um, is the number of employees and one is the number of years, okay? Or 14 over two, which reduces to seven over one. So seven employees per one year. That's the rate of change between that time span, okay? So let's do the same thing with number two, okay? Uh, this time I want to find the rate of change over the interval of 96 to 99. So now... I am looking at this segment right here from 1996 to 1999. Again, it would be nice if I could count my rise over my run from my graph, but again, those points aren't on uh, whole values on my graph, so I'm going to have to actually use the two points they've given me. So I'm going to come over here, erase this so I've got a little more room, and I'm going to write down those two points, which are 1996 and 32 and 1999 and 41, right? So then we're going to label these x1, y1, x2, y2, and I'm going to plug them into my same formula, right? To get my rise value, I'll be doing um, 41 minus 32, okay? And my run value would be 1999 minus 1996, and when we subtract that, I uh, get 9 over 3, which is reduces to 3, or 3 over 1. And it's positive. So when I write that in terms of this context, this tells me that the rate of change of employees between that time period means that they are gaining, because it's positive, they're gaining 3 employees per year during that time period. Okay? They gained 9 over that three-year period, which means they gain, they're gaining three for every one year, okay? All right, easy enough. So by now, you should be able to do the third one, basically, by yourself, but we'll go through that. They want to know, actually, no, this one's a little different. This one says, during which uh, of these two time periods did the number of employees go faster? Well, there's a couple ways we could look at that. You could just look at the segments. If the one that goes faster means that you need to have the steeper line segment, right? So my guess is it uh, is the f this first one right here. And then just compare your rate of change. This is seven employees per year, and the other one was three employees per year. So obviously, uh, 1994 to 1996 has the greater rate of change, okay? I can see that visually from the graph because it's steeper than the other segment. And I can see that because of the slope value of 7, which is bigger than the slope value of 3. Okay? Uh, the fourth one. Now, here we go again. Find the rate of change in the number of employees between 99 and 2002. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take these two points and write those two points down. And I can see that there's going to be a negative here. That line segment's going down now, isn't it? So 1999, it had 41 employees, but in 2002, they only had 38 employees. So I think we're going to get a negative slope here, which tells me that they're not going to be gaining employees during this time period. They would have lost employees during this time period. Okay. So if we label our X1, Y1, and our X2, Y2, and plug these values in, we would have 38 minus 41. And we would have 2002 minus 1999, okay? When we subtract, um, we would see that we get a negative 3 over a 3-year period, which would be negative 1 over 1. So what does that tell us in terms of the context? That would tell us that we are they lost, or they're losing, one employee per year okay, during that time period because they lost three employees over a three-year period. If you do your rise over your run, you lost three over a three-year period. So that means that you lost one employee per year. Okay? All right. Let's go to number five. And here we're changing uh, the scenario. What we're looking at here is the table of values. Um, it, they want us to calculate the rate of change of the function in the table. And what you have here are you have the, the number of the tickets needed for the rides. Okay. And then here you have the cost. All right. So I can see that 10 tickets 
costs $12.50, 12 tickets, $14, you know, per ride, whatever. So what we're going to find out here is by, by doing our rise over our run, um, and re remember, these are your X's, these are your Y's. And the change in your X and the change in your Y is what you're interested in, okay? But also keep in mind that slope is rise over run. And the change in your Y's is your rise, and the change in your X is your run, okay? So what I like to do is I like to look at the change in my Y's first. So what's happening here? Well, I can see that it's going up $1.50 every time. Okay, so I would say I got a plus $1.50, right? And then I can see that my tickets needed for the rides is going up by two every time, okay? So that would be a plus two. So I basically found out that uh, I have to pay $1.50 for every two rides, or to simplify that, I would say that it costs 75 cents per ride. Okay? 75 cents per ride. All right. Now, number six. These questions get a little challenging. Just stay with me on number six. It says, estimate the change in the dependent variable over the given interval from the domain of the independent variable. Okay, now that sounds like gibberish if you haven't been paying attention. So let's, let's uh, redefine some of this. The dependent variable. Okay, the dependent variable is always your y value. Okay, because y always depends on x. Right? And what we're going to do is we're going to find the change in that dependent variable in our y's on a certain interval, just like we did above, um, given a certain domain. Remember, the domain or the independent variable is your x. Okay, and then we're going to estimate the rate of change. Now, that's a very complicated way of asking you to do what we want you to do here. Okay, so just stay with me on number six, and let's talk through this one. So here we have a graph uh, that shows me uh, distance over a certain time period. Distance in miles over, uh, looks like a 60-minute time period. They want us to just look at the interval uh, of time. T is time. So when I see T here, I know that we're talking about time. They want us to just look at the interval uh, between 20 and 40 minutes. Okay, that's what this compound inequality is telling me. So on my graph, I'm really just interested in the time period from 20 to 40 minutes. I'm just interested right here in this time period. Okay, so I want to know information about just that time period right there. Okay, now the first thing they asked me to find is the change in D, so D of T. Now remember, that's just function notation. And in this case, D stands for distance. So what we want to know here is the change in our distance during that time period. Okay? So look at your values here. This point right here would be 20, comma, uh, 2. And this point would be 40, comma, 1. Okay? So to find the change in the distance, that's basically your rise value. That's your rise, okay? okay. Or you could think of it as just taking uh, your y values here and subtracting them, okay? And you would get a change in distance of one mile, okay? So from in the time period from 20 minutes to 40 minutes, okay, the distance only changed one mile because you were at two miles here and you're only at one mile here. So the distance changed one mile over that time period. All right now rate of change so now you're putting that together with your time because rate of change is defined as your rise over your run now you got to look at how all these pieces fit together this is your rise over your run right well i can get that from the graph rise over run okay um but you also want to look at what you already have. If you have the rise to be 1, it's actually a negative, isn't it? Because you're, you're losing 1 mile, okay, over a 20-minute time period. Okay? So your rate of change would be minus 1 mile over a 20-minute time period. Okay? Remember, your rise is your vertical change. 
and your run is your horizontal change. Okay? And your vertical change is a negative 1, and your horizontal change is 20 because you went from 20 to 40. Each box there is not one minute. Each box is actually 10 minutes, isn't it? Okay? So it's one mile, you're losing one mile every 20 minutes. Okay? All right, let's look at the next one. Same kind of thing here. Uh, we've got shirts and yards of fabric. Now you'll notice in this particular graph, the dots are not connected. Well, that's just so you'll realize that, you know what, we aren't really making one and a half shirts or one and three quarters shirts. We're making a shirt or two shirts or three shirts, okay? So that's the difference on why these dots aren't connected and these over here are, all right? So here we want to look at the interval between 3 and 5. S represents our shirts here, okay? So we want to look at the interval from 3 to 5. So I just want to look from here to here. This is the interval I'm interested in right here. Okay, so they want me to find the change in F of S. Now, F of S is your fabric. Okay, that's your dependent variable. That's your Y axis. Okay, so I want to look at basically your rise. This is talking about your rise. When you think about slope, rise, over, run. So when I go up like this, you think how far do I have to go up to actually connect to get over to that one? Okay. And it looks to be uh, 4. It has to go from 8 all the way to, this would be 12, right? So 8 to 12. So that would be uh, 4 yards because it's your y-axis. So the rate of change I would find by putting uh, 4 yards over your shirts, because your shirts are your X's, or your S's in this case, and what was the time period? It was two, right? Three to five would be a difference of two. So, two shirts. Okay, so what your slope would tell me is that I need four yards of fabric to make two shirts. If we simplify that, that would simplify down to two yards per one shirt. Okay. So that's what your slope would actually be in simplified form. If you need two yards of fabric for every one shirt. Okay? All right, those can be kind of tricky. I just don't understand what it's asking. Because when they use function notation, a lot of people get confused. They I don't understand what that's telling me. Anytime they use function notation like that, think of it, that just replaces y. Okay? That's all that is. Okay? Your, in this case, like t is your x. That's your x-axis. And look right here. That's your y-axis. Same thing here. S is your x-axis, and F of S is your y-axis. So whenever you see it like that, they're just wanting to know the change in the y value, which you correlates to the rise when you think of rise over run. Okay? All right. Uh, let's move on. Part two on the back. Here, uh, you're just graphing again. So just uh, using slope and y-intercept, graph these uh, numbers 8 through 13. These um, you can kind of do on your own. I'll graph them up here. You gra graph them by yourself, and you can just watch me and see if you get the same answer. Uh, we've been practicing this, so this should just be a review. Okay. Notice it is in function notation, but again, it's the same thing as f of x is the same thing as y. So instead of seeing y equals mx plus b, you see f of x equals 3x minus 4. It's the same thing. Okay. Negative 4 is my y-intercept. My slope is 3, so I go up 3, right 1 up 3, right 1, okay, and that would give me my line. Okay. Same thing here, f of x equals 1x plus 2. It's the same thing as y equals 1 half x plus 2. Exactly the same thing, just one's in function notation and one's written as uh, given in an equation format. Um, my y-intercept is 2, my slope is a positive 1 half, so up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2. If you want to get points to go in the other direction on the line, I'm going to go down one, left two. Notice they fall right in line. Okay, and there's a picture of that linear equation. This one would be y equals negative one. This is one of those special ones because there's no x, right? And if you're ever in doubt, what I always do is I just start making me a list of ordered pairs. So this means the y value is always negative one. x could be anything you want. Okay, 
And then if you begin plotting those points, you notice that, oh, all these points are forming on a uh, horizontal line. And that's right, because this is the graph of a horizontal line. The slope would be 0 here. Okay? If you were to write it in mx plus b, it would be 0x minus 1. See, the slope is 0. Okay? All right. Uh, 11 4 thirds x. Here, your y-intercept would be 0 because you don't have that plus b, so it would cross at the origin. My slope is 4 thirds, up 4, right 3. And let's go the other way, down 4 and left 3, and there my points fall on the line. Okay? All right, 1 fourth x minus 3, minus 3 being my y-intercept. My slope is 1 fourth, so rise 1, move right 4. Let's go the opposite direction, down 1, left 4. And here is that equation. Of course, you're using a ruler, hopefully, and have a much straighter line than I have. And then number 13, uh, negative 5x plus 1, 1 being my y-intercept, slope of negative 5, so down 5, right 1. Notice my line is going to go down. Let's get some points up here, though. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, left 1. There you go. Okay. All right. Uh, last two, 14 and 15. These are uh, more like the ones we practiced on the front. So let's look at 14. It says um, a plumber charges $50 for a service call plus $75 per hour. The total cost of these in dollars is a function C of T of the time T in hours on the job. For how many hours will the cost be $200 or $300? Now, it's not that this problem's hard. It's that the wording makes it sound much harder than it is. Okay, so let's break this down. This sentence right here is the important one, right here, okay? The total cost in dollars is a function, C of T, of the time T in hours. So what that means is, if you look at your graph, C of T correlates to your Y, and T correlates to your X axis. So instead of us writing Y equals MX plus B, in Function notation, which is how they're describing it, you're going to have C of T equals M times T plus B. Okay, all that means is you're replacing X with T because, look, your X axis stands for time, right? And that's in hours, actually, based on the word problem, okay? And our Y axis represents C of T, which in this case is cost, and that's in dollars, all right? So, now let's go back and plug our numbers in. Plumber charges $50 for a service call plus $75 per hour. So, one of those numbers is your slope and one's your y-intercept, okay? Well, let's think about it. If T stands for the number of hours that you work and you're charging, and he's charging $75 per hour, then it's 75 T plus the initial cost, even if he doesn't work anything, just, just the service call itself, okay? That's another... $50. So 75t plus 50 would be our function rule, okay? Um, which would be the same thing as 75x, y equals 75x plus 50. You put it in terms of x and y, okay? Now, uh, they want us to graph it, okay? So uh, I'm going to do that by plotting my y-intercept. Now let's look at the graph. This graph looks to be counting by 50s, right? So I'm going to start here at 50 and put a dot because that's my y-intercept. And then I'm going to go up 75 and over 1. And it looks like my time is counting in increments of 1. So I'll count up 75. So let's see, that would be 50. That 75 would be um, in the middle here. Then I go over 1. So then I could go up 75 more. So let's see, that would put me... 25 here over 1 would put me here. And I could keep doing that, right? Up 75 over 1, up 75 over 1. So it looks like this is going to be the line that's graphed. Okay? Make sure you realize how we counted up 75 here over 1. Up 75 over 1. Got to use your scale over on the side of your graph there. Okay? Now the question is how many hours will the cost be 200 or 300? Well, couple ways I could do that. I could go to my graph and I could find 200. Well, if this is 100, here's 200, right? So I could say, all right, that's right here on my graph. Match that up down here with the number of hours because that's what they want to know. How many hours will the cost be 200? Well, this point right here 
is 2 comma 200. So that means at two hours, uh, the cost is $200, okay? So uh, I'm going to put at two hours, cost equals $200, All right? Then they want to know about the 300. Well, 300 is not so obvious because 300 would be here. And if I come over here and look at my line, that doesn't match up. Right, it's actually, it's not, that's not right on my graph. It's actually somewhere between three and four. Okay, your graph's probably much better than mine. But it's not right on four, it's somewhere between three and four. So there might be a better way to figure out what that is other than just, um, you know, guessing at it. So what I think I'll do is I think I'll take my equation that I wrote here and I'll replace the cost with 300 and see what I don't see what I get for T all right let me let's do that for 200 so you understand what I'm doing okay we already know we already have this answer but let's let me use the equation to show you what I'm doing so if I replace C of T the cost with 200 and then take 75 T plus 50 and solve it for T by subtracting 50 from both sides so 150 equals 75 T and then dividing by 75 on both sides, okay, you'll see that I get 2, okay, which matches what our graph. That's why we have uh, $200, 2 hours, okay, and we could do it algebraically. Well, we're going to do the same thing since my graph isn't much help to me for this one because I can see that it's not going to work out nice to a whole number. But now I'm going to replace the cost with 300, okay, and solve it the same way. So I'm going to subtract 50 from both sides. So 250 equals 75t, and now when I divide both sides by 75, I see why I don't get a whole number on my graph, right? I get about 3.3 something, okay? So I'm going to put approximately here, right? So when I go to my answer sheet up here, um, I'm going to write down that at approximately... 3.3 hours, the cost is $300, okay? It's not exactly 3.3, but it's close enough, okay? All right, last one. A bamboo plant is 10 centimeters tall at noon and grows at a rate of 5 centimeters every two hours. The height in centimeters is a function, h of t, of the time t it grows. Again, here is the important part here, making sure you understand what that gibberish means, okay? So you can see from your graph, h of t represents your y and t represents your x, okay? So we're going to come up with an equation. Instead of y equals mx plus b, you're going to have h of t is equal to mt plus b. We're just replacing x with t and your y with the function notation h of t. h obviously standing for height, okay? Let me label these graphs. So t, this would be our time, and it is in, it doesn't say, yes, hours right here, hours. So this is my time in hours, and the y-axis is our height, okay, and it's in centimeters. Okay. All right, so now let's plug some numbers in there, see if we can figure out the slope and the y-intercept. A bamboo plant is 10 centimeters at top, at noon, and grows at a rate. Okay, I think this at noon part, that's giving me the initial starting height. So 10 is going to be my y-intercept. So I'm going to put b equals 10. That's going to be my y-intercept. And then it tells me it's growing at a rate of 5 centimeters every 2 hours. So that tells me that my slope value is going to be 5 over 2, 5 centimeters every 2 hours. Okay, so if I plug that in our little function rule here, h of t is equal to 5 halves t plus 10. That's going to be our function rule. Okay, now, when will the plant be 20 centimeters tall? Hmm. So all I have to do now is uh, graph it and see if I can figure it out that way. If not, we can do it algebraically like we did the other one. 
So let me go ahead and, and graph that. Let's plot our y-intercept of 10, and then we got to count our rise over our run. Now look at the scale. Here we're counting by fives, okay? So when I go my rise of five, I'd actually want to only want to go up one block because five units is one block on this graph, okay? But when I go over two for my run, I do want to go over two whole blocks because that axis is counting by ones, right? So if I go up five units, over two units, that would give me this line for this dot here. Go up five more, over two. Up five more, over two. Okay, and this would be our line. Okay. Let's see if we can use our line to get an answer. If not, we'll have to do it algebraically. Oh, what the heck, we may do it both ways just for fun, right? They want to know, uh, when will the plant be 20 centimeters tall? When? So I'm looking for a time when the height is 20. So I'm going to go to my height axes right here, my y-axis, go to 20. I'm going to scoot over to where it hits my graph, which is right here. See if you can't match that with an exact time, which I can. It looks like four hours. So I'm going to say um, at four hours, 20 centimeters tall. And I'm basically abbreviating, you know, what my answer needs to be. But you're telling me that at four hours, then the, the plant will be 20 centimeters tall. Now, how could I use my equation to do that? Let's say you didn't have a picture of the graph. Well, what we would do is we would take our equation, and I would replace the height with 20, because that's what they tell me, the height's 20. So I would take 20 equals 5 halves t plus 10, and I would solve that for the time. So we could do that by subtracting 10 from both sides. Okay, remember what you do here when you get a fraction? Don't you dare tell me to divide by a fraction. You would tell me to multiply by its reciprocal. Okay, so t would equal whatever 2 fifths of 10 is, which is 4, which is exactly what our graph shows us. So that's why we have 4 hours as our answer. Okay. All right, good stuff there, guys. So you're going to practice on your own some now, um, being able to answer those types of questions and making sure you understand how to, you know, connect the function notation to the omx plus b equations. Okay, so uh, look, keep this out on your desk as you work through your homework problems, and good luck.